welcome to what's happening now on kblkradio.com and thank you for tuning in. This is your host Bishop Bowser and we have an exciting show for you today and everyone should be listening. So right now I want you to text or call seven people and encourage them to tune in to the show. All right. So don't just stand there. Let's get busy. Pick up that phone. Uh, you can even email somebody or tweet or send it on Twitter. Or post something on Facebook. But let let's get this going. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, this morning we have a great show for you. We have Lachey Collins. She is the president of the Association of African American Educators, and this week's topic is school violence versus racially motivated discipline practices. And so. <clears throat> We're going to talk about that, but I want to just give you a little uh, commentary and some information that I've done some research on. And school discipline has been defined as having two main purposes. A, ensuring the safety of those within the school, and B, creating an environment conducive to learning. Administrators may also be attempting to C, reduce rates of future misbehavior, and D, teach students needed skills to successful for successful interaction in school and society. In terms of deterrence, there is no data showing that out of school suspensions or expulsion reduces the future likelihood of students disruption. Studies of suspension have consistently found relatively high rates of repeat offending among those who are suspended, suggesting a clear lack of deterrence for those students. Similarly, there is little evidence supporting the notion that removing troublesome students improves the learning climate for the remaining students. Suspension and expulsion are apparently used to rid schools of students who are perceived to be troublemakers. In long term, school suspensions has been found to be moderately associated with high rates of school dropout and has been reported to be used in some schools as a means of encouraging certain students to drop out of school, the so-called push-out phenomenon. For over 30 years, a national, state, district, and building level data, uh, the documentation of dis disciplinary overrepresentation for black students has been highly consistent. Recent analysis have found rates of, uh, of out-of-school suspensions between two to three times greater for black elementary schools students than white students. Now, in the Voice of San Diego article titled, What the Fight at Lincoln High Reveals About the School's Longstanding Tension, is written by Mario Caran and um, Rachel Evans on March 3rd, 2016, and it stated, whether the violence is real or perceived, district and school leaders need to plan to address the perception of school violence. So far, they're still waiting for the, that plan and the person to make it happen. Now, according to the Voice of San Diego report, uh, here are, at, uh, are the 10 least appealing schools to parents in their neighborhoods. And these, and when I saw this list, it kind of disappointed me because I went to two of these schools. <laughs> and, and the school that's on the top of the list where, um, uh, the, the, where parents will least likely go to, even though they live in that community, was Memorial Prep. And I, that was Memorial Junior High, and I went there. I attended. I graduated from Memorial, and uh, then uh, they have Far, they have Bell, and then number four is Lincoln, where uh, you have a high percentage of people that live in that community do not go to Lincoln; they go to other schools. And then um, you go on down. You have schools like Man, Millennial Tech, Crawford, San Diego Complex, which is or San Diego High, another school I attended also, Knox and Roosevelt. Now, let me read to you the, the, uh, the, the 10 middle and high schools that are best at maintaining local parents' confidence where they send their, schools, their children to these schools in the communities in which they live. Merlins, of course, you know, that's out in La Jolla. And let me just tell you, I went to Merlins, too. You know, uh, when, um, I, when I first uh, went into junior high, back then, junior high started at seventh grade, um, they bust us out there. And uh, I think within a, a month or two, we got kicked out. They were finding reasons to suspend and kick folks out of the school. And I think within a month or two, I was kicked out of there and sent to Memorial. <laughs> so uh, also they have Marshall, they have La Jolla High, Stanley, Challenger, Scripps, uh, Ranch, uh, Sarah, <clears throat> Mira Mesa, Point Loma, and University City. 
So studies have demonstrated that a disproportionate number of students who are expelled from school are from low-income families or are students of color. Now, one thing I want to bring out and, 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 and talk about is the Equality Index. The 2015 Equality Index of Black Americans is 72.2%. That means that rather than having a whole pie, which is 100%, which would mean full equality with whites, blacks are missing about 28% of the pie in the areas of economics, health, education, social justice, and civic engagement. Black people have a higher rate of unemployment and lower income. They remain far more committed to the labor market than white workers on average. San Diego County unemployment rate is 5.4%. Statewide for blacks is 12%. Note, there are different categories that make up the Equality Index, which is economics 30%, health 25%, education 25%, and social justice 10%, and civic engagement 10%. Now, there are 450,000 San Diegans live below the federal poverty line. Poor individuals living in poor neighborhoods face a doubly challenged set of circumstances, including higher crime rates, lower performing schools, fewer nearby job opportunities, and worse health outcomes. A number of studies have shown that families trying to climb the socioeconomic ladder out of these neighborhoods need to overcome their own individual hardship, hardship at the same time that they face greater external challenges and have less community capital than better off neighborhoods like La Jolla or Point Loma. Communities like Southeast San Diego are low-income poverty-stricken communities. Over 50% of the people live in poverty, and yes, most of them work. So, according to a story by Marie Maggie on March 10, 2012, Hispanics and African-American students are expelled and suspended at rates disproportionate to the population in many San Diego County schools, despite ongoing efforts to make discipline uh, policies equitable. Data released from the U.S. Department of Education's Civil Rights Office last week revealed the disparity in student discipline outcomes nationwide. A review of, of the data by the uh, Union Tribune uh, shows a similar trend in local schools. The department's report compiled statistics from about 85% of the nation's kindergarten to 12 uh, 12th grade students during the 2009 and 10 year school year, producing its most comprehensive report on the issue. Now, nationwide, the report shows that African American students make up 18 percent of those enrolled in schools that were studied uh, uh, that were studied for the national survey and accounted for 35 percent of suspensions. More than 70 percent of students involved in school related arrests or referred to law enforcement were black or Hispanic, according to the survey. In San Diego, Unified School District, Hispanics made up more than 46% of students, and they accounted for nearly 62% of all exposures. Blacks represented about 12% of students and made up more than 25% of out-of-school suspensions. Now, that is a problem, and uh, uh, we want to get into that, delve into that, and talk about that. So today I have with me Lachey Collins, and we're going to like dive right into this um, uh, this show here. So, Miss Collins, welcome to What's Happening Now, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right. So, tell us about yourself. You know, we, we, we want to know who Lachey is. Oh, boy. Well, um, first off, I am Lachey Sharp Collins. All right. I'm also known, um, you know, because Sharp is my, is, is my maiden name. Uh, I am the daughter of... Winston Sharp Jr., who is a, a well-known person here in San Diego, uh, California, in regards to him coaching for Millennium Park Pop Warner for over 30 some odd okay. years. So, but I am a, a San Diego native, born and raised right right in the heart of of um, sub sub district E, which is located, of course, in uh, Southeast San Diego. <clears throat> I received all of my education over here by attending John F. Kennedy Elementary, Gumper Secondary School at that particular time. Um, but also Lincoln High School. And so, um, born and raised, grew up here, and continue to come back to the community and, you know, then always give back as well. 
Um, I am a married mother of two beautiful children. All right. <laughs> I have um, a girl and also a little boy. I have uh, received my, my higher education by attending San Diego State University. All right. Where I received my bachelor's in Africana Studies. I received my master's in, um, in education, and I'm currently a doctoral candidate in education leadership at San Diego State. I am also an adjunct professor at San Diego State as well, teaching in the Africana Studies Department. Um, but born and raised... Um, love my San Diego community. I love Southeast San Diego so much, and so that's just a brief, I mean, just a really brief <laughs> glimpse about me. Um, but um, uh, this this area is is my everything. It is it is my life. Uh, besides me, of course, living over here in Southeast San Diego, I am currently the district director for a California State, um, you know, Assemblywoman, and um, I am her education policy consultant as well. All right, then. Very good, very good. Now, you, you mentioned Dr. Weber. How long have you been working for her? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I worked at San Diego State as well prior to coming over to um, to this political side. So, uh -huh. I've been with her for about, ooh, what, 14 years, 13 years? Yeah, somewhere close to almost 14 wow. years. Wow. So, 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 you were with her not only since she was uh, State Assembly, but uh, what, was she, what did she do before then that you were, when you were helping her? She was the department chair of Africana Studies. Oh, wow, okay. So she's also one one of the co-founders of, of, of the Africana Studies Department at San Diego State. Wow. So I've been with her for a very, very long time. I, I actually ran her, her district office, well, not district office, but her um, her actual department at San Diego State. Oh, so okay. So I was the department coordinator for Africana Studies. How did you guys meet? Oh my God! I went to school with her children, so we went to school oh, together, and we okay. were in the drill team and things like that together. I'm over at Gumper Secondary mm -hmm. School at the time. Okay. So okay. that's how we originally met. Was way back in the day. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That, that's that's very good. So now, um, what what were your responsibilities? So when you were, did your responsibility shift, or you always was focused on education with Shirley Weber? I've always been focused on on education with her. Okay. Like okay. One hundred percent. So while I while, while I was at San Diego State, um, before I actually started teaching there, um, I I did uh, do a lot of mentoring and things like that there. Um, and by running the academic department, I had to handle the the academic scheduling. Mm -hmm. So I actually scheduled every Africana Studies class. Mm -hmm. um, I handled their cultural studies events across mm -hmm. the campus. Mm -hmm. um, I ran their Black Baccalaureate programs. Wow. Um, I did a number of things that actually pertain to people of color right right on the campus of um, San Diego State so wow wow so you did that for a number of years wow wow okay so so um what okay we, we're going to go ahead and take a break and I'm gonna come back because the next question I want to ask is going to take more than a little bit so we got a um uh break for commercials so we want all our listeners to stay tuned because we'll be right back after this brief break so stay tuned and uh, we'll be right back with what's happening now and our interview with Lachey Sharp Collins. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to what's happening now. And thank you for staying with us. Uh, we're right in the midst of an interview with um, Lachey Sharp Collins. And um, she's running for the, the school board in District E. And uh, we most definitely going to get into that. We want to get into what happened at Lincoln. And we want to get into a lot of good things here. So uh, we most definitely want to continue this uh, conversation uh, uh, with her. Now, um, uh, you're also the president of the Association of African American Educators, right? Yes. yes. Now, um, how long have you been the president? Um, it's going on. It's going on two years. Two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Years. And how long have you been involved with the organization? Oh my goodness. Um, I've probably been involved with it for about seven to eight years. Okay. I originally started more so behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, I have got pushed from behind the scenes to being, you know, um, pushed to serving on the board and being, you know, a little bit more visible. Um, and so, but for the last two years, I've been president prior mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. vice president. And then prior to that, I was the financial secretary. And then, you know, so, so I've been, I've been involved for, like really actively for mm -hmm. the past yeah seven eight years. Okay, mm -hmm. and and can you tell us about um, the uh, Association of African American Educators? Yeah. What's that all about? The Association of African um, of African American Educators. It was founded back in 19, um, 1983, mm -hmm. um, and it's an organization that is geared around advocating for our our teachers, but also for our students and also for our classified staff. So we're talking about everyone who was involved in 
in the field of education who is of African descent. But even more so in our recent years, it has opened up to everyone of all backgrounds, basically those who, you know, those who share the same interests as, as <clears throat> us in regards to making sure that African and African American students achieve. Uh -huh. uh, our primary goal is to close the, the achievement gap. And so as we talk about closing the achievement gap, we're also focusing on closing the attitude gap as well. Okay. Because we have to do that in order to close down, um, you know, to minimize or shrink down this, this larger achievement gap. Right. Um, over the years, um, under the leadership of Mr. Wendell Bass and, and a number of other people, mm -hmm. um, the organization, prior to me really being heavily active, right. they've drafted the blueprint to accelerate the achievement of African American and African students. Oh. This blueprint was adopted by San Diego Unified. Uh, back in 2010, um, it was drafted. <clears throat> excuse me, earlier, you know, like about three three years prior. But then it got revised back in 2009, mm -hmm. and then um, adopted back in 2010. Mm -hmm. This blueprint has uh, four focus areas, and so those areas are um, that those are key areas for which we're holding the school district accountable for in regards to giving us an annual report or, or a quarterly report in regards to what are they doing to ensure that African and African American students and teachers and so forth are having um, all of their resources available to them to ensure that we close whatever gap you want to right, call it. Right. Achievement, excellent gap, um, attitude gap, whatever. Right. So it was developed to make sure that we have these these four key areas mm -hmm. that will that that would allow us to hold the district accountable mm -hmm. um, in these areas to answer what are we doing. So yeah. Now, so and and when you talk about holding the school responsible, it's just San Diego Unified or all the school districts here in um, uh, San Diego County. This one is just for San Diego Unified. However, the Association of African American Educators is a countywide okay org, and so we are open to everyone. Okay. Um, but it just so happened that the original founders of this organization, right, they were all a part of San Diego Unified, mm -hmm. so we continue to have that stronger relationship. Okay. Um, but under my current leadership, we've been um, bringing in everyone else as well from you know from across San Diego County. Oh wow! Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, very good. So. Uh, Miss Miss Collins, mm -hmm. uh, you are running for a political office. Am I right? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> what, uh, what are you running? Uh, what are you running for? I am running for San Diego Unified School Board District E seat. E seat. Mm -hmm. All right. And and uh, what, what motivates you to, to like pick up that and say, man, I'm I'm going for it. <laughs> well, you know, I've been thinking about it for years, to be honest with oh, you. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Um, but then. Over you know the past couple of years, even more so, really the last two and then last year and so forth, um, you know it it just became clear to me that our school district is at a crossroads. Right. Um, a number of parents, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've spoken with that are both south of eight and also north of eight feel as if the system is not set up appropriately, you know, will set up appropriately right now to where kids are constantly being failed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and so. And then I've also been talking to other people, and, and it appears that the community, mm -hmm. they don't have a voice. Right. Um, right. Our kids are not having a voice. Right. And so I want to be the one to be that vital link to bridge the gap between the community and our educational system. Okay. And, you know, we are taxpayers. Right. The money, right. money that's piped into these schools is our dollars. Right. right. So we should be able to have a voice at that table mm -hmm. to ensure that, um, that the proper resource is coming in. Mm -hmm. So, but... I, I, ch I chose to run because our kid, the system's at a crossroad, and people feel like the system is failing children mm -hmm. by passing them, knowing that they're one year behind or two mm -hmm. years behind, so we're constantly playing catch-up. Mm -hmm. You know, you have kids that are going off to college that are not properly prepared. Gotcha. And that's one of the issues for community colleges. You have a lot of remediation mm -hmm. happening at the university level mm -hmm. and at our community college level. Mm -hmm. What can we do to fix that? Mm -hmm. And this is where I want to step in. Now, do you, do you believe that that is a, 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 a lack of resources or better quality teachers? Uh, because I know that, you know, like in some of the schools like La Jolla or in, in schools like that, they're better prepared and they, they exceed on the tests and so on. But in our communities, it seems to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you have any answers for that? I have to say that it's everything that you just said. Okay. 
So, um, of course, it is a lack of resources. But in my personal opinion, I don't see why we have a lack of resources right now, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, especially when you have a new funding model called the Local Control Funding Formula. Okay. And that model has pumped in so much, so I mean, a lot of additional dollars to you know to <clears throat> a number of districts throughout the state of California. Mm -hmm. But over the past year for San Diego Unified, you got additional fifty-two million dollars that was on top of your original base funding. Wow. And then this year you had ninety-two million dollars on wow. top of your additional funding. And so the, um, that money coming in is targeted for um, English language learners, mm -hmm. um, low low income families, mm -hmm. and foster youth. Wow! So if you had a school that is seventy percent, um, you know, at well seventy percent based on all all of those levels, mm -hmm. you're going to be really hundred percent. Then you'll get seventy percent more on top of your wow. your base funding. So that money should come to the schools. Unfortunately, in our case, is going to the district. So the wow. district is, is, they're the ones who's making the decision on which schools are getting how much. According to them, they have spread it equally, mm -hmm. but you can't spread it equally across San Diego Unified. Because, right. once again, that's that's not that's not equity. Exactly. So and the that's equity has to problem. come over to South of Eight yeah. versus yeah. North of Eight. So to answer yeah. your question, yes, okay. it's all of it. I, I'm glad you brought that up, and that's what folks need to be talking about is equity. Because we're already, lag our community is already lagging far behind. So if you're going to split a pie, that's not, uh, it, it's not going to help us. Right. You know, because right. we need way more help. Every single more. penny should be coming <laughs> into our into our district right. so that um, uh, we can catch up. Right. We're trying to play catch up. You know, um, we're talking about, and that's the thing people don't understand. You're talking about years and years and years of racial discrimination and segregation and the whole yeah. bit of just uh, uh, neglecting. The schools in our in our district, and um, you most definitely have a fight on your hands, okay. uh, and and uh, I, I, and we have to rally the community together. We all have to come together to fight. We got to hold that school board accountable. And um, uh, do you now with the school board? Do you believe that if if um, do they make this? Let me just ask it. Do they make the decisions when it comes to the money and where it should go, <laughs> or and like what you've been on there, and 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 those decisions and votes that have been made, or is it? The county, I mean, how does that work? Well, um, so the district is, they are responsible to prepare a local control accountability plan. Okay. And that plan is approved by um, by the San Diego County, county Board of Education. Okay. Now, that plan has to be approved by the board. Okay. But is but 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 the thing is, is the board involved in formulating everything, you know, actually right. putting together? No. Oh, okay. That comes from the chief financial officer and um, the superintendent's officer or whichever. In my personal opinion... The board should be a part of it. Right. So we got to start, like, with community folks and organizing. We got to start meeting with those folks. Yes. Okay. I'm glad. That's yes. good to know because it kind of works just the way the San Diego County works with, you know, mental health and all of that. You know, they have this one person hounding the budget and making decisions, putting everything mm -hmm. together. And then, it, some, then mm -hmm. of course, they eventually submit it to these other folks and they just trust in them to, you know, to think that. that they're doing the right thing. Well, for the local control <laughs> account, for the, for the plan itself, you are required to have community input. Mm-hmm. Now I can tell you that, um, that right now the only input, well, prior to my leader, well, prior to my my current leadership role in in actually um, getting the superintendent to allow outside uh, community folks who are who are not a part of school site councils to mm -hmm. um, to come to the local control accountability meetings. Right. Um, initially, it was only the school site council reps mm -hmm. you know, or the or the DAC uh, reps who are who would be the people sitting at the table to talk about how these monies are going to be used. Mm -hmm. The problem is, honestly, across the board, a number of people have not been properly educated on what local control funding is and how it is supposed to be used. Mm -hmm. So is is that? I mean, I, I we, we you, I mean, you most definitely brought out some things that I hadn't heard before. Um, and of course, you know, I'm I'm more involved in racial justice and things mm -hmm. like that and mm -hmm. because of this is a part of racial justice. Is. Um, That's why it was implemented. <laughs> yeah, man. So is that why you're running or, or why why would you what would you tell folks why you're running? Well I am running because I want to give back give back to my community. I okay. strongly believe that I can be the vital link between the students, the community and the educators to restore trust and credibility to to the to the current school board. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that I can be the moral the moral compass mm -hmm. to that board to help them understand um, uh, Cultural diversity mm -hmm. um, issues mm -hmm. to help them understand the urban the urban community, mm -hmm. um, um, but also to make sure that that the urban communities are getting um, their their overall just just dues. Right now, now um, the the interim um, board uh, member that's for over uh, District E, mm -hmm. I believe her name is Sharon. Yes. 
Um, and she is replacing Marnie Foster. That's, that's good. Um, now, I guess my question is, is, you know, you stated that you was going to run for office before Marnie Foster resigned. Right. And so on. Now, uh, uh, were you even bef if if the, if the scandal had not come out, were you still thinking about challenging her? That is correct. Okay. And what what did you see needed to be done that wasn't getting done? All right, I'm gonna lay it out to you in three key words, and I can break it down. Okay, do it. Opportunities, engagement, and success. Okay. So when I'm talking about engagement, I am talking about the fact that. Um, our community need they need to be informed or actually taught in regards to how the current district works mm -hmm. and, and how they can navigate the whole process right. pertaining to Santa Cruz Unified or any other right. school district as well. Um, but but then the parents they need to be included in all stakeholder conversations. Our community they are stakeholders, right. so they they need to be included in that. As I'm talking about engagement, mm -hmm. when I'm talking about opportunities district e has very limited resources okay okay but we can have all the resolutions in the world right but if, but if they sit on the shelf <laughs> it doesn't matter whether right. or not they are you know a resolution mm -hmm. so uh, so when i'm talking about opportunities under my current leadership I've, I've been able to make sure that district e gets some of the seminar programs back and get their gate programs back because just just a year ago i can tell you lincoln high school barely had anything Wow. Okay. So now Lincoln has a number of courses put back, but through my organization as well, we're still pushing. We need more. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, our gate programs are very limited over here. So how is that going to prepare these kids to get into AP classes to be able to enroll in various um, apprenticeship programs mm -hmm. to get them into different, you know, electrical programs, get them here on a radio program right. as right. an internship without having the proper skills. Right, and we need to do that too. You know what I mean? So how so how can we do that? So when I'm talking about opportunities, that stuff has to come. But two, District E does not have a compact for a success program, which is a guaranteed admission into any CSU wow. by having a a, a 2.0. Wow. So meaning C average students. Mm -hmm. If we can get that over here, then we could talk about changing the whole dynamics and the image of District E. Mm -hmm. And then and then of course we will have success because now we have kids who are excelling, kids who are put into their proper courses. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of course options available to them. Mm -hmm. Um and then so now kids are at, they're they're dreaming bigger. They right. know that there is college out there for them regardless of them being a C average student. Right. Right. They they are now exposed to other job opportunities in case they don't right. go to college. Right. Right. So this is where I'm at when I say engagement, opportunities, awesome. success. success. Okay. Those those three they all awesome. come together. Okay. And I wasn't seeing a lot of that happening. Okay. And I have these connections uh -huh. to get that done. Right. And I'm doing it now. Okay. So why not continue <laughs> if I'm in the seat? Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean I, I know a lot of people um uh, uh like Marty Foster, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of black leaders and, and so on in the community. I, I couldn't like judge her either way because I didn't know her and I really wasn't following uh, the work that was being done in the school. All I, uh, the only um, uh, perception I had of her is, is I was on a panel at Lincoln dealing with gangs and sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And she was there and some other school officials was there and so on. And um, uh, the, the, they showed a documentary and the documentary was called Indoctrinate. And that documentary was so racist, and it was basically trying to get people to see, think that only black and brown people were sex traffickers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I called them out, and I called school officials out, and I, I blasted them for doing that. I told them I was appalled that they were showing that documentary and that uh, uh, the, 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 the documentary itself was actually indoctrinating people mm -hmm. to be, and brainwashing them to believe that, hey, you know, these guys only sex trafficking. That was the dominant narrative. They talked about a little bit of everything, but that was the dominant narrative. And when I, I saw M M Marty Foster was there, and so I was kind of disappointed uh, that that happened. Uh, but as I listened to people in the communities, people did, you know, they, they were saying that they like her and things like this. So I kind of like mellowed out my opinion in a sense, but that was the, uh, the first uh, impression I had is what happened at that school. Well, well, I can tell you that she's done a lot of good things for the district. Mm -hmm. She really has. Mm -hmm. She really, really has. So um, I just want people to know and also to, to remember that she did a lot of good for district. Right. She right. did it. Amen. So what do, what do you see as uh, the, the greatest challenges in District E? Oh, my goodness. So some of the greatest challenges, I, I wouldn't just really leave it 
um, to only focus on on District E. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that that overall the school dis district itself is struggling with ensuring that there are equitable measures in place, mm -hmm. uh, cultural competency things in place, mm -hmm. course development, mm -hmm. enrollment, mm -hmm. and uh, proper student placement, particularly in District E. Okay. Um, in my personal opinion, this district has too many competing entities mm -hmm. because it is a very large district and it poses challenges to move everyone towards a common goal that all decisions need to be based on student needs versus the adult needs. Okay. So that's that's what I'm seeing happening right now. You have the, the, the district is so large um, and then the whole focus is kind of shifting from kids to adults. I need to do everything I can to bring it back from adults back to kids mm -hmm. because without quality education none of us would be sitting right 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 now now so so um uh can you share what are some of your plans or or you you know i, I know you're still developing and, and looking at some things but do you have any idea or plans right now as far as what you want to do for district eight well i just shared them the, that I, right there i kind okay. of summarized some of them okay with you. so talking about the issues <laughs> things you want to fix yeah <laughs> all right well, okay so, okay yeah so yeah so, that worked but that worked. the biggest ones is making sure that we get these vocational and training programs put over here to okay. expose them to job prospects but get a compact for success over here for these kids okay Okay, that'll work, and we need that. So um, I want to move into something else here. Okay. You know, uh, what is your opinion about the incident that happened in Lincoln High School? I have to take a deep breath on that because <laughs> I am an alumni of Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. I love my, I love my school to death. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> you know, the all right, situation. we got some Lincoln High School folks <laughs> up in here, alumni. <laughs> this situation is very, very tragic, and it's. Um, tragic for everyone that is involved and traumatic shall I say for everyone that was involved um, and even those who were not directly affected right right um, and so I honestly hope that that the school district will do it do everything it can to fix this current situation um, by ensuring that the kids who were directly affected um, achieve their overall quality education I know we have a number of people who are seniors mm -hmm. want to make sure that these folks still graduate mm -hmm. Um, I do want to make sure that that they do a thorough investigation mm -hmm. of what's going on and mm -hmm. hold everybody accountable. Of course, you know, everybody should, you know should feel responsible for whatever role they've actually mm -hmm. played. You know, played through this. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the video should be released. Mm -hmm. I know that they said that they were going to release the video. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the DA has it. Mm -hmm. the DA says we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, in order to keep people, to keep things transparent, to let the community know what's going on, that video should be released. And do you think that the video should be released to the public at large or just to parents or just, I mean, who should it be released to? I think our community have a right to know okay. what happened. Because this didn't just affect the kids there and the mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. There's a whole community rally behind this. School. Right, so, right. And so when we talk about quality schools in every neighborhood, mm -hmm. You have to remember that these schools are community schools, right. so the neighborhood is directly impacted. Right. We we all have a right to see that video. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Um, you know, the problem that I have is, um, and I'm not, I don't want to point the finger at anybody, but you know, in the sense of accusing people, but I think there is an issue when it comes to this video because. What ended up happening is, is you have, um, whether it's the DA's office, law enforcement, whoever it is, 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 draw, is, is drawing or framing a narrative when they say, oh, these kids, they hit these uh, police officers, they knocked him on the ground, they did this, and he's injured, he's in a wheelchair. And so there's a narrative out there mm -hmm. that um, they are painting, a picture they're painting, about what happened. Mm -hmm. They're talking about it. So now we're we're talking to students and they're saying something else. Exactly. So we're saying, okay, let us see the video. Uh, so I think it, I, if 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 the the district attorney, whoever, wouldn't have came out and said anything, and would have just said, this is you know we're dealing with kids, you know, there's confidentiality issues, mm -hmm. and you know we're going to resolve this in court. We're keeping mm -hmm. everything confidential. Then I can say, okay, I can understand the argument. But when you come out and start saying things and putting mm -hmm. things out there and accusing and saying this is what this student did, this is what this student did, and telling the media this, then there's a problem. Right. It's a problem. And so now we need to see the video. Right. At, at one time I was saying, you know, that first meeting we had, I was saying, you know, I don't know who it should go to, maybe some parents <laughs> or whoever, a few leaders or whatever. But now when um, when I look at it and when I see it, it's kind of like, 
okay, you guys took this a little too far, so let's um, uh, uh, let's see the video now. Right. And so, I, do you think that they're going to release it? No. No. <laughs> no. So we're probably going to have to take them to court, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, this this is the main reason why the Assembly Woman, Assembly Woman Weber, introduced that body camera bill that was killed uh -huh. a year ago, because of situations such as this. Mm -hmm. um, and so, this video should be released, especially when you have a bunch of video clips that students have actually mm -hmm. taken. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have the media who's taking these clips and put it out there, and of course, now you're changing things, calling it a brawl and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the kids are telling you that that's not what it is. Right. Right. So if we can get this video out some way, somehow, mm -hmm. and help shut down all, all the negative conversation about it, then that would be great. Um, right. You know, so, so something has to happen, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to keep keep the pressure on to get the video released. We know right. that the superintendent said she wants the video released. Right. Unfortunately, it's out of her hands. Mm -hmm. But us, us as the community um, and us working for, well, at least me working for a state legislator mm -hmm. and others, I know that they're going to keep the pressure on to find out what's going on right. and can we get this video released. Right, so. right. Yeah, and, and you know, because I, I know that um, the ACLU is involved also in, Correct. you know, with the incident that happened before. And now, I will say this, is that Chief Zimmerman, you know, I'm a part of an advisory board for a black advisory board to Chief Zimmerman. So we have meetings from time to time. When the cameras came out, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that I ask is, uh, are these um, uh, when you, these body cameras, the videos, are footage, are you going to release it? She said, no. You know, right. So I know that's always been her position is that she's not going to release any video footage of anybody when it comes to uh, videos. Uh, uh, and she said she, of course, have to weigh. Uh, how detrimental it is to the public mm -hmm. and, and so on. So uh, 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 we hope that they do it. I just don't know how you're going to put the pressure on them to do it because, you know, if they don't want to do it unless the courts and, and make a ruling that they do it and they have, they're going to do that, they need to move fast and get get that process going. But by that time, our kids have probably been graduated or whatever has happened. Okay. And I think that's very important that these kids that are affected by this, the most important thing is their education. Exactly. You know, and, you know, when you're talking about suspension, the expelling and locking up and things like like that you know that's not helping yeah. you know uh, we need to be talking about recovery we need to be yeah. talking about intervention and prevention and so on yeah. so if you were on the school board for district eight how would you handle this situation well um number well so number one as i stated in the voice of san diego mm -hmm. article mm -hmm. i was saying that the the board and the leaders itself need to um come out and connect with each student on a personal level. Mm -hmm. When I'm saying that, I'm saying that you need to not sit there and wait for somebody to call you to tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. You need to do grassroots efforts to get out here to connect mm -hmm. and try to build the relationships to let these kids know and, and, and let the community know that you are 100% behind them. Right. Um, <clears throat> so if I was on the board, I would definitely be the way I am here with you. Right. I want to be meeting with the different kids who have been affected or those who haven't been affected right. just to have a conversation and let them tell me what is needed right. so I can bring that back to the board. Right. Um, two, the kids that were affected, I would have made sure from, from day one, whoever got arrested, I want a homework packet put together. I want something put together. And was that done that was not done for these students? No, um, okay. it, it wasn't done initially. Okay. Um, initially. Um, but I, I want a homework packet developed for these kids. If they had to go, you know, had to get arrested, mm -hmm. which is to me nobody should have right. at that moment. But those who were arrested, I want homework packets put together to make sure that they are not behind. Right. Okay. That way, as soon as they are released, they can go right back into the current situation mm -hmm. and be able to um, be, you know, be um, be right on task. Right. Versus them coming in and now we got to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Two, I would have um, from the beginning pushed that we uh, we do not arrest, you know, do not incarcerate the kids. Right. Right. And do not incarcerate these kids. Right. Wait until you do your investigation before you right. start, you know, um, you know, handcuffing kids. <laughs> that is a very traumatic, <laughs> yes, you, know, it is. you know, situation for these yes, for these is. young kids. Yeah. Two, well, not two, but what, three or four? Mm -hmm. um, I would have called a parent community meeting from the very, very beginning. All right. So starting from Friday, when all, when everything kicked off, it would have been me, my area superintendent, my principals, and so forth. Everybody stand up. Mm -hmm. We are having a meeting. We're right. going to have a meeting to go over everything, and then we're going to start developing the plan immediately. Mm -hmm. And as we develop that plan, um, th that plan was going was going to you know deal with safety issues. Right. That plan was going to talk about how how teachers are going to teach the next couple of days. Right. Well, now this part did happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I would have been calling a plan, um, calling a meeting about that 
then I would have had a parent meeting, two of them. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a parent meeting in the morning. We're going to have a parent meeting in the evening for people who do have to, you know, people mm -hmm. who work and so forth and who can't be there. And during that same week, I would have had a larger community meeting. All right. All because right. the so community have both. a right to yeah. have, a, you know, have yeah. a conversation yeah. in yeah. this. Yeah. And I, I, I like the way you, you, you made the distinction, you know, you said parent community, because I, I was, you know, talking with someone, I was just saying, hey, you know, community includes the parents, but I, I do think it's a separate issue in the sense that parents who are directly affected by mm -hmm. this and their kids is going to the school, uh, most definitely uh, that issue need to be addressed and parents need to know what's going on and so on. And so that's that most definitely important. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, there's a lot more, but I know our time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do, do, do you believe uh, that black and brown students' disciplines are racially motivated? A number of them are. Yes, a number of them are. Okay, in, and, in and how can we, I mean, when, and, and, and when you uh, say you believe that, um, that's kind of hard to identify, I mean, that's to identify to deal with because nobody's going to claim that. I mean, but when you look at the stats, you say, man, some, there's a problem somewhere. That's it right there. You, got, you have to look at the stats. It, mm -hmm. You have to not be afraid of the data that comes in, exactly. good or bad. Right. So if the data is showing you that there has to be some type of discrepancy or, or some kind of disparity, mm -hmm. you know, or targeted to happening to the urban kids, mm -hmm. then you need to face the reality of that and figure out why is that happening. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I honestly think that there that some of these issues are racially targeted, and that has to do with the way we are being portrayed on the TV, mm -hmm. with the videos, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and just different things. And then also, you know, community itself, um, our our community get it gets labeled. Mm -hmm. Right. It it is labeled. However, this is this is the best community ever. Right. We're right. one of the safest in, 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 in overall reality. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, yeah. So. It, you know, and, and that that's one of the things. So, I mean, when you look at Lincoln, you know, I didn't go to Lincoln. I, you know, of course, I was banging, game banging. <laughs> so, I used to go up to Lincoln sometimes. But, you know, I went to um, San Diego High, Kearney Mesa, and uh, Hoover. Mm -hmm. was last school? Hoover's last school. But I, um, I went to San Diego High first because that school part of my community. But I got kicked out. I got uh, expelled. Then I went to Kearney, I got expelled. Then I got expelled out of the whole school district. And then um, uh, the next year, I went back to Kearney, I got kicked out again, went back to San Diego High. And, um, and then my mom moved out to East San Diego, City Heights. Okay. And so they were telling me I had to go to Hoover. And, um, uh, but I want to stay at San Diego High. And you know, you, you probably think this, this I'm, I'm, I'm making this up, but the same day, my mother went to Hoover, got the transfer slip. And the same day she's at San Diego High, in the office, giving them this paper so they could sign it so I could stay at San Diego High. They brought me in the office because I just got in a fight. <laughs> so the person that was going to sign the paper said, nah, you out of here. <laughs> so I ended up having to go to Hoover High and um, and then I ended up dropping out of high school because I, I just got too deep in the game banging thing and ended up dropping out of high school and so on. And and I, and, but I, but you know, I went to Hoover, I went to San Diego High, you used to go to Lincoln and Moores and, mm -hmm. and schools like that. Mm -hmm. And I see today how they try to make, you know, they'll they look at Lincoln and try to give it a bad name and schools in our community a bad name. Why do you think that is? I don't see it that way. I don't but. see it that way. As I, as I said in my statement, um, when I was one of four candidates um, to, you know, to be selected to fill in the, the interim seat, I, I said that you're going to have to take a step back and really look at the rich history and, and the culture of District E, mm -hmm. which includes Lincoln, Morris, right. and uh, Crawford. You know, mm -hmm. this this district is is an amazing district. They have a lot of innovative and uh, talented alumni from all of the different schools uh -huh. and folks who, and, and people who actually want want to give back. And so, you know, um, people think about the past. You know, mm -hmm. the late eighties, you know, and, and, and early nineties, and the fact that you know it was it, it, back then it was a largely African American community. Right. And you know, over time things have changed. Now it's mostly Hispanic now. Mm -hmm. Um, so people want to continue to look at that like, okay, well, this is where all, all the black and brown kids at, and it has to be bad. Right. They don't understand that most of the stuff that that goes on that's crazy mm -hmm. is for the bait. Right, right, you right, know? right. Um, Lincoln <laughs> we just don't hear about it. Right. <laughs> Which is the problem. They magnify things that are over here mm -hmm. 
and minimize the things that are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, Lincoln community, really the cluster itself has had um, its issues over the years, but it is not one of the worst schools or the worst districts to be in at all. Right. It's actually right. one of the safest right. um, areas to be in. And um, and this and this community is very resilient. Mm -hmm. We always bounce Absolutely. back. Absolutely. <laughs> we always bounce Absolutely. back. So, yeah, people see it that way because of who we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be, because of who we are um, and because of the fact that back in the day it was a predominantly African American area and they segregated and us and, yeah, and yeah. so when you think about segregation mm -hmm. back in the day mm -hmm. and how things were, were, were actually labeled then you look at okay the resources that did not go over there exactly. and where the resources went um, so my goal is to change that image yeah. as, as I said in my statement I said I'm tired of District E being looked at as a second class citizen now let me mention something about the statement that you made in the Voice of San Diego, because uh, you stated in the Voice of San Diego that the fight and how it was handled highlights a lack of leadership. What did you mean by that statement? I'm talking about leadership itself in regards to um, everyone who everyone who was involved to minimize the current situation. People escalating mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not I, I'm not talking about our our principal or or things like that. It. It, it just boils down to the overall leadership structure from the top down to mm -hmm. the district level, mm -hmm. all the way down. Mm -hmm. If you get everything put up, set up properly, mm -hmm. and uh, and then everybody can respect everybody, mm -hmm. and everybody have a clear un understanding mm -hmm. of how things are supposed to roll out, mm -hmm. then the way the situation end up coming out, it would have never happened this right. way. Right. Because everyone would have been all on the same page. Right. So your leadership got to be tight right. to get the rest of your leadership tight. Right. So, if the right hand don't know what the left hand is doing, mm -hmm. then we're going to continue to have this this button of heads. Yeah, absolutely. Often. Absolutely. So let's get the you know the the top done. The mm -hmm. way the right and left can mm -hmm. come together, and everyone else can understand how the district is supposed to function. How our officers, how our teachers, community administrators, our classified staff, all can you know can properly help implement strategies, whether safety strategies mm -hmm. or academic strategies or whichever together versus you know continue to create some type of divide okay. everybody has to trust everybody involved now, now let me ask you something uh, um, in regards to the leadership what is your opinion of principal John Ross I think principal Ross um, he is a very good person mm -hmm. I I think that he's doing um, a really good job there okay my thing is that he, he needs the help right. he needs the support mm -hmm. um, he needs to know that he have that, that is he, he asking for it yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, parents have asked. Okay. Parents are saying, we support him, but we need you to back him. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Right. So we need the district to back him. Mm hmm. We need the community to continue to come back to back him. So I'm just calling all alumni mm -hmm. to come on out, mm -hmm. you know, to to actually support him, um, because you know, hey, we we have to make sure that people understand what type of legacy Lincoln High School has. Right. Right. You know, right. And the overall right. impact. So John Ross is doing a really good job there. He has um, under his current leadership, they've been able to minimize the number of, of incidents um, as far as you know our um, you know police incidents and things like that. Our fights and things like that, as far as the campus, um, but he's been able to identify key people um, who are leaders, and so he's been able to build up their leadership regime there, as far mm -hmm. as among student leaders. Okay. So he's been doing a really good job. He just needs additional support. Right, right. So, so your attack was not on John Ross no. and the um, voice no. of your, voice of San Diego. No. All right, y'all hear that right? <laughs> no, I was not attacking him at all. <laughs> all right. So. Um, do you know if anyone has? Uh, it's been kind of quiet from the mayor's office. Uh, do you know if anyone uh, 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 has heard from the mayor, Mayor Faulkner, I in do, all of this? I do not know. I do know that we we've invited someone from his staff to attend one of our uh, meetings. So when I'm saying our meetings, I'm saying the Sydney Woman Web. Right, meeting. right, right. Um, but no, we haven't personally had a conversation, so I I don't know. So well, okay. Let me ask some. In a situation like this, what role Mayor Faulkner should be playing? Um, as of right now, nothing. Okay. Um, my, in, in my opinion, because right. you want to leave out the city politics too. Right. So you don't want to bring the city politics into the education politics. Okay. The lines, That'd be a the problem. lines can get blurred, and then you know. So get out of this. Stay out. <laughs> and then once again, we're going to forget about the kids. So he may be doing the right thing. Yeah. As far as right now, as far as and, right and stand up. Okay. As far as right now. Okay. So I'll take you for that. Okay. Okay. So uh, what do you think should happen to, uh, if I pronounce his name right, Bashir Abdi? The school police officer that tased Jesse. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And let me before you say that, you know, our prayers goes out to him too yes. and his family. And uh, we want to see him recover. We don't want to see anyone just be fired, uh, 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 you know, or, or you know, uh, lose their livelihood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so you know, we, you know, we just want the right thing to be done, and we don't want to just reach for something and try to accuse him, accuse him. Because right. one of the things that I said is that you know you can't fire somebody or get rid of somebody that no one, even if there were. People had issues. No one put in a written complaint and started a process, a formal complaint, and started a process. You know, uh, that wouldn't be fair to him. So we must be fair to him in all ways. We pray for his speedy recovery. And uh, we're we're sorry that this incident happened. But, you know, he has to take responsibility for his role in that. And I think right now they're trying to blame the students and no one is looking to him, at least in leadership. Right. Exactly. Um, So... As far as this, you know, this this officer, the only thing that I that I would say is is this: he does not do not put him back at Lincoln High School. Okay, okay. I'm just gonna leave right there. You okay. Just don't put him back at Lincoln High School. That's very good. All right, we're running out of time, and uh, um, uh, we thank um, <laughs> Lachey. We thank you for being Miss Lachey Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for we thank me. you for being on our show. It was it was good and and as always, you never have enough time to uh, get through everything, you know. But um, uh, I think you know our listeners uh, had opportunity to get to know you, oh, great. And, and, okay. and and see who you are and what you're doing and how you would be a uh, instrumental in uh, changing things mm-hmm. and making things better in District E. And so I'd like to encourage all my listeners to come by and visit our church worship services on Saturdays at 11.30 a.m. at 610 South 30th Street, uh, San Diego, California, 92113. Uh, Lachey, you have something that you want to say before we close out? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that District E is a first-class district, and and I want you all to see it that way. Right. And know it that way. It is a first-class district. So Amen. come on, come on over to this community and visit us. That's right, that's right. So thank you for listening and tune in next week for another great show on what's happening now with your host, Bishop Bowther on KBLKRadio.com. And may Yahweh bless you.